Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We had some technical difficulties on our end. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Demi Toms, and I am the NLSW committee member. Um, we're going to begin the session with the land acknowledgement. So I would like to start by saying that I acknowledge the land on which I live and work is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today is the gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and acknowledging reminds us of the great standard of living related directly to the resources and friendship of the Indigenous people. I also wanna acknowledge that the land acknowledgement is only a small step towards the work that still needs to be done. And I invite each and every one of you to take some time to educate yourselves and learn the truth because without truth, there is no reconciliation. So thank you all for attending the session. Um, the summit is put on by the YWCA Niagara Region, um, which is a local organization that stands for gender equity and gives a voice to those who are marginalized in our community. The YW offers emergency shelters and three stages of transitional housing for homeless women, men, and families to help its clients step-by-step break the cycle of homelessness and poverty. Now more than ever, this is a critical, this is critical for the wellness of our community. And if you'd like to learn more, go to ywcaniagaregion.ca. I also want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the Niagara Leadership Summit for Women virtual event is designed to facilitate a safe and open space for all participants. By participating in this session, you are agreeing to follow our community guidelines. You can find the guidelines in the left-hand side menu under important documents. We are all responsible for making this an inclusive environment and we appreciate your support in doing so. The session you're attending is Holding a Path to Sky, Lessons from Women Activists for Our Future. Work undertaken by women that often goes unrecognized can be considered as much activism as what has been accomplished by those whom we ascribe the title activist. In learning about women with a variety of backgrounds and experiences, you will gain tips to enable you to begin your life as an activist or take what you've been doing to the next level. This webinar will benefit those entering the world of activism and anyone who's been resisting to call themselves an activist. Leela has lived a life of cultures and countries, one of few multiracial children born in the 1960s London, UK. Leela was taught she had a duty to work justice and to use what privilege she had for good. She came to the Niagara region in 1970s when, where are you from, was a very common question. She left Niagara to go to university where she engaged in advocacy and activism. The anti-apartheid movement, developing sexual assault policies where none existed, raising issues of systemic racism, sexism, homophobia, and more. Leela is proud to call herself an anthropologist. Her career has been one of working to end oppression transforming universities into institutions, leading societal change. She wants us all to be able to maintain curiosity and be independent thinkers. We ask that if you have any questions during the session, if you just pop them into the Q&A tab, or you can send me a private message by clicking on my profile under the details tab below. And that's enough for me for now. And so I'm going to pass it over to you, Leela. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank the YW and all the sponsors for making sure that this important event goes ahead again, even if we are in a virtual space rather than in a uh, in one where we are together in a in a room. I'm going to share my screen. Um, although, let me see if I, I'm not sure if I can. It said it was not. I think you have to let me share, Demi. You should be good to go now. Okay, great, thank you. I'm honored to be with all of you today, um, especially to speak about the ways in which all women have the courage to lead, even if we don't know it or doubt it, have had a setback or been told we lack what is needed. I'm going to uh, begin with, a, with another land acknowledgement because I feel that as was said, 
it's important that we each think of this in our own ways. My daily thinking is informed by the Silver Covenant chain of peace, which was originally a link between the Crown and the Haudenosaunee peoples. The three links of the chain represent a covenant of friendship, good minds, and peace, which will always remain between us. The covenant chain is made of silver, symbolizing the relationship will need to be polished from time to time. According to Haudenosaunee oral history, this relationship will be everlasting for future generations as the rising faces of our newborn on Mother Earth will benefit. It shall stand as long as the sun shines upon the earth, as long as the waters flow, and as long as the grass grows green. Our relationship shall be binding as long as Mother Earth is in motion. As I see it, my side of the links are tarnished to the point where we can't really see the silver anymore. My daily work is to reflect, unlearn, and relearn. At some point, when we settlers have done enough work, there may be talk of reconciliation, but I have no right to force that. I can focus on developing my good mind, polishing the silver, and engaging in conversations that speak to the impact of cultural genocide in this land now called Canada. I also acknowledge that colonization in Canada included the forced displacement of African peoples enslaved in lands where they did not choose to be. The phrase women hold up half the sky seems to have originated in the 1950s in China. In some ways, what's always interested me more is why we would need a phrase like this but as well as the fact that most of the time I think of it as being inaccurate. Women are often, in my opinion, holding up most of the sky, but they're doing it without recognition or appreciation written out of so many histories and their work is unsung. That's meant it's sometimes hard for us to know the role models whose courage can make us better leaders. So as we begin this time together, I would like to be able to do a quick poll to see who you see as your sheroes. It's a, a simple poll, so you're only getting uh, one choice in this particular one. And I'm hoping that this will, will work. I can't actually see because I've got my PowerPoint on, but I'm sure that Demi will let me know uh, if you can all see your uh, poll. So your choices are a relative, someone I've met, someone I might meet, someone I would love to meet but probably won't. The pictures that you have in front of you show Berta Ciceras, a Honduran environmentalist and indigenous right activist uh, who successfully stopped the world's largest dam builder in, uh, in Honduras, but who was assassinated in 2016 at the age of 44. The collage above it of black activists, including Rosa Parks, Zora Neale Hurston, Sojourner Truth, Malala, Below Malala uh, Yosefzai is a collage of indigenous women, including Autumn Pelche, Sheila Watt-Kluche, Christy Belcourt, Sage Pohl. And the last picture shows women who've been the victims of acid attacks in India, who've come together to open up a cafe. Demi, can we actually see the results of the poll? I'm just working on pulling them up for you right now. They're um, in event mode, so everyone's responding in there. Oh, okay. Um, so, just waiting for them to come through. One second.
this loading. <laughs> okay. Um, so 59% said a relative, 27% said someone I've met, 9% said someone I might meet, and 5% so said someone I would love to meet, but probably won't. Great. Thank you so much for, for reading those for me. It's really exciting to me, I think, that the highest percentage is uh, a relative. And if I had drilled down, I know that I often hear my mother or my grandmother. Um, uh, and that's even more exciting to me. And I think it's one of the lessons of activism that we may have a, a Shiro who we know and who we can talk to and learn how they've done what they've done, that there's no need for the Shiro to be famous or known around the world, although some of your relatives may be that as well. However, I, I think that the mythology still exists that great leaders spring fully formed onto the world stage. And that can be really difficult when that happens, because I think it takes us away from thinking that we can be activists, that we can be the change we want to see. And uh, Paul Loeb, who wrote The Soul of a Citizen, writes about uh, Rosa Parks and the fact that she's reduced to the woman who was too tired to stand on the bus. And when we know we, if we remember that Rosa Parks had actually trained and worked with activist organizations for 10 years before that particular moment. But the conventional portrayal makes it harder for us to imagine that we would do this ourselves. And the suggestion that we, uh, that we need to be ready to leap into action immediately uh, to take a bold and visionary stand without any learnings behind it. Uh, and I think it also says that change is instantaneous that rather than a series of incremental and often invisible actions that gradually and then together gather momentum and influence events. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is that behind the scenes what's happening, um, the, the depiction of someone like Rosa Parks as a lone pioneer reinforces a more romantic but false idea that anyone who takes a committed public stand has to be a larger than life figure, someone with more time, energy, courage, vision or knowledge than any sort of one of us might be. So I'm very glad that 59% of you have that feeling already. My own journey into activism mirrors somewhat what I've been talking about in terms of a mythology. I was born into a family whose lives were devoted to making the world a better place. And to make sure I understood that, I was given two quotes when I was seven. Uh, so the top one from Nikolai Ostrovsky, um, which has the final line that uh, in dying, you had the right to say, all my life, all my strength were given to the finest cause in the world, the fight for the liberation of humankind. My mother's family were founding members of the British Communist Party. Um, and then the second one is uh, from Nelson Mandela's speech from the dock in 1964. And the final lines of that, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Uh, that creates quite heavy expectations for a seven-year-old. I'm not sure I really fully understood what was being asked for me, from me. When I was about 10, my mother gave me a book about famous women. Uh, and when I look back, and I've not been able to find a copy of this particular book, I realize it was a pretty eclectic combination of women. There was uh, Boudicca, Cleopatra, Mary Curie, Anne Frank, Valentina Tereskova, Maria Montessori, Joan of Arc, 
so women who, who led armies, they're scientists, educators, astronauts. I, having read that book, I read Anne Frank's diary and uh, I wrote to her father to tell him about the effect it had on me. Uh, particularly Anne's statement about how wonderful it is that nobody need to wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Uh, he wrote back, Otto Frank wrote back to say how happy he was that her message was still reson resonating so many decades after her death. So I arrived at university and I realized that being told to be an activist was very different to actually being one. As noted in the introduction, I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement um, at McGill, founded a, a group for women students of color, was an editor on the Daily Campus newspaper. I was a very angry activist. Um, if people didn't understand issues of systemic discrimination, I had no patience with them. I gave no grace. Uh, I can look back on that very angry 18, 19, 20 year old. And I wonder if perhaps I had taken to heart almost too much the actions of two of the women in the book that my mother gave me. Um, for those who, uh, who don't know uh, Boudicca, who, uh, and Bodicea is sometimes written, uh, was the queen of the Iceni. And uh, after her husband was killed by the Romans, uh, she wasn't allowed to take over as ruler. Uh, she and her, do d uh, her daughters had also been assaulted and tortured by the Romans. And she took revenge uh, by gathering together the Iceni and uh, burning down two Roman uh, cities, uh, including London, um, the fledgling London, in the course of which somewhere between 40 and 80,000 people died. Uh, the Romans were humiliated, mostly the uh, woman had wrought this shame on them. Uh, so that was one of the stories that resonated with me. And then the one that's lesser known is the Rani of Yancey, uh, who uh, again, after her husband died, uh, was not allowed to be ruler in this case by the British in India. And so she trained her own army and uh, went into battle against the British and was killed. She's become an uh, uh, iconic figure now in India. There's a regiment that was founded in the 1940s called the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. Uh, there's statues of her uh, across the country. Uh, as you can see in one of those photos, there's a Bollywood epic about her. And I think it was the, the, both of these women resonated with me because they were taking very direct action and their raw anger mirrored how I felt about injustices in the world. It's taken me some years to learn the lessons um, from experiences of an understanding for the need for humility, of how to best engage with those who don't agree, how to build better coalitions and to ask for help. And so I want to talk about some of those lessons that I've learned along the way to being an activist. One of which is acknowledging our ancestors, uh, thinking about uh, what they've done. The picture on the left uh, is from the Battle of Cable Street where uh, Londoners who opposed the black shirts, the Nazis uh, of Oswald Mosley, stood in, against them marching through the East End of London where the majority of the population was Jewish. It's the first demonstration my mother remembers going on when she was uh, about four. Above it uh, are pictures from a school in India that my female relatives have always been on the board of a school that started out for for girls uh, early in uh, in India in Bangalore, and 
I like to remember those uh, as actions taken by my uh, predecessors. I also remember there was a, a TV series called Shoulder to Shoulder about suffragettes. And now we know there's a lot about the class and race privilege of suffragettes in most countries. Um, but one of the things that remains with me is Dame Ethel Smythe's uh, anthem, Shoulder to Shoulder. Shout, shout, up with your song, cry with the wind for the dawn is breaking. March, march, swing you along, why blows our banner and hope is waking. March, march, many as one, shoulder to shoulder and friend to friend. Which leads to the second uh, uh thing that I learned along the way, which is keep bringing others along with you. And I like the way that Alicia Garza, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, talks about this from her decades of uh, mobilizing. Figure out what you really care about. Find other people who care about the same things that you do join them, and once you do, keep bringing other people along with you. For those who uh, may not know, the tattoo uh, uh, on Alicia Garza's heart is June Jordan's poem, Poem About My Rights, and the bit that's tattooed is, I am not wrong, wrong is not my name, my name is my own, my own, my own. And I can't tell you who the hell set things up like this, but I can tell you that from now on, my resistance, my simple and daily and nightly self-determination may very well cost you your life. The other thing I learned was that activism happens in different forms. Clearly, it's not just demonstrations. There's other things that are happening that create change. But it's taken, it took me a couple of years to start welcoming the ways in which particularly the arts play a role in activism. And so this is just one example from Emmy, uh, world champion slam poet, and who uses that skill to talk about refugees around the world. Uh, her family came to the United States from uh, Sudan. And she says, I use my words to raise the alarm on the conflicts of our time in the hopes that someone might hear something that moves them. The reminder that each of us hears different things, even if we're listening to the same song, poem, speech, etc. And we need to be able to have those different voices talking about these issues in different ways so that we can work out how we choose to take action. So my next question for you is what actions have you taken? Uh, I've got uh, different forms. I, you can say you've done different forms of, uh, of action using social media, chaining yourself to a uh, fence in this case. In this case, they decided to also be bare-breasted uh, because the banner says, can't bear the truth, um, or participating in demonstrations. So what has been your experience in taking actions? And then the last, uh, I also have a picture of a petition uh, on the side, signing petitions or uh, devising petitions. And I know now it may take a moment or two for those answers to come through. Ah, wait, do we get to see some multiple forms? So people have, have uh, undertaken multiple forms. 
uh, that 12% have been on demonstrations, 6% of you have changed yourself to something, um, and 29% of you social media, and then there's multiple forms that people have done, which is great. Uh, if we were in a room together, I would then sort of start asking you other things that you've done and uh, which, you know, what you've, uh, uh, which one of those actions uh, that you've done. Uh, the next question um, is, uh, what prevents you from taking actions? So I don't know if you actually need my screen. I don't think you need my screen to be able to answer that. So but what prevents you from taking actions that you'd want to take? So if you haven't changed yourself to something or you haven't participated in a demonstration, what would be fear, exhaustion, discomfort? I won't be good enough that we have to reach a certain standard in order to uh, take a certain action. Fear, exhaustion, discomfort. So we have a well, exhaustion and I won't be good enough are now tied. So talking a, a bit more about the no, the exhaustion, but the fact that we won't be good enough, I think is something else to, that I'll, I'll talk about in terms of, um, of being doing activism, but that fear which I think exists particularly for women about not being good enough and feeling that we have to have uh, got to a certain place before we can um, actually move forward with whatever action it might be. Thank you for for those uh, for the polls. I think it's it's really helpful for me to 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 see where uh, each of you have uh, have been in this. Uh, okay, so given this, we look at the number of you who are exhausted and some and the number who are also thinking that maybe you're not uh, good enough to do this. I think a question that may arise, particularly from the exhaustion, particularly at this moment in time, 18 months or more into our global pandemic, is, is there any point in even taking action? And I turn to Toni Morrison, who said that there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Speaking to, she's speaking to writers and what writers do in terms of taking action. But I think that it, her her words, um, as with so many of her words, speak to me directly. And I think when we wonder about whether there's any point in trying, I'll try and give you two examples where individuals made a decision to do something. They weren't sure what would work. And so they began with no knowledge of success. The Chipko movement, and Chipko means uh, embrace. So this is embracing trees, uh, literally tree huggers uh, in Northern India in the 1970s when companies came in and started, that wanted to clear cut basically. And um, the indigenous people of that area regard the trees as living and are part of their lives. And so they did the one thing they could think of, which was to hug the trees. And so the images you see are of women and children hugging the trees to protect them. And it worked. And it spread across Northern India as a way of protecting life, the life of the trees. And we're seeing it now, we're seeing it in uh, in British Columbia, uh, where similar scenes are, are enacted right now. 
but the women did this with, as I said, no knowledge of, as to whether it would work. They just felt they had to do something. Wangari Matai won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for uh, her contribution to sustainable development, democracy, and peace. But she's also someone who began uh, her life. She was fortunate in that she was born and received an education just on the cusp of a number of things happening in Kenya. Um, she always says if she was born a, a year later, she probably wouldn't have got an education. But she puts down the work she did to being close to nature. Um, she was a vet and she went, traveled all over Kenya. And she saw the degradation of the environment, the stress it put on the lives of the women, because women tend to produce most of the food. And this is where when we think about women holding up half the sky, and I think about them holding up most of it, it's that women around the world tend to produce most of the food on the land. The forests were being cleared and replaced by commercial plantations. There was more drought, loss of biodiversity. We know this story. And she decided to take action. And she decided to take action directly with women. And it began small and uh, it became huge. So she's planted her movement. Um, she unfortunately died at a relatively young age, has planted more than 30 million trees and helped not over 900,000 women um, across Africa. And she also, she did what she felt might work in order to be able to try and reverse what was happening in her country. But she didn't really stop to say, is there any point to it? She felt something had to happen, particularly because women were suffering so much. I have a tendency to also think, is there any point, uh, particularly uh, the, over this past couple of years? And when I was younger, I could get into that mode for a long time. As I've grown older, I know I can look back and see some slow, incomplete changes that have happened. I saw Nelson Mandela walk out of jail after 27 years and be able to speak his truth. I got made sure when I went to graduate school at the University of Cambridge that I and two other Canadian graduate students developed a sexual harassment policy at this 800 year old institution, which is obviously changed along the way, but is still in place. At my previous university, uh, the four men there were members of the football team um, who took a lead on working on issues of sexual assault prevention. And uh, we brought at that same university Liver and Cox to campus uh, and thousands of students uh, were there wanting to speak with her and interact with her and have conversations. And those are the elements that give me some cause for hope when I'm in my, is there any point in doing anything mode. However, I think in order to be to get out of that or to begin, uh, particularly for those who are thinking, I don't know what I, you know, I'm not good enough to do this, is thinking about that first step. Now, I realize Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, quote, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step, doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Uh, some people really need to see the top of the staircase or the bottom of the staircase. So there may be a better metaphor for, uh, for each of you that allows you to think about incremental progress. Taking, you can move forward in, uh, you know, with small steps, um, whether or not the staircase is there. Um, but to move forward incrementally, and that that is all right. And so if we're thinking about those first steps, what is it that we're going to do? Uh, 
the United Nations in trying to make sure that everybody knows about the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, uh, has come up with a number of ways of uh, talking about this. And I do parenthetically think is really important for people to know about the SDGs, um, to think about how we're going to meet these by 2030, to think about the ways in which uh, reaching equality and equity is woven in amongst all 17 of the SDGs. So what can we do uh, as a society to uh, reach them? But they came up with this lazy person's guide to saving the world. Now, I'm really not sure about this, I have to say. I don't think I would have titled it the lazy person's guide to saving the world, because as we know, uh, many of you are already suffering from exhaustion. So to uh, give you something else that you have to do could be really difficult. Um, you just don't have the time or the energy. However, so if we take out lazy person's guide, I think this does, it's divided up into things you can do from your couch, things you can do from your home, things you can do in the workplace, things you could do in the community. And so I think that looking as we try and break whatever that, uh, whatever work we're trying to do to break down into component parts, and then think about what it is that maybe at this point in time you have to do from your couch, but next week you're going to be able to do in another way or take a different step. So I think there's value in thinking about uh, this guide um, or looking at this guide. And it, when, if this presentation is shared, there's a hyperlink there so you can uh, go through and uh, look at what those suggestions actually are. Bustle magazine uh, decided to uh, interview 52 young activists ages 12 to 25 to ask them what they suggest people think about when planning to be an activist, to get into activism, to do something. So this is their 13 suggestions for what people should do, their best advice for moving forward. Um, as you can see, being bold. If you want something to happen, you need to make it happen. Learning from mistakes. And we've certainly, I've certainly done that. Use what privilege you have wisely. Be solution focused. Don't get involved in a competition. Think cooperatively. Maybe there's two different organizations both working towards the same goal. Does there need to be two organizations? Is there a way to bring those together and be able to harness that energy in concert? Spend according to your uh, principles, be kind, don't try, just do. So a number of different ways that you can make and take action. Sorry, Actually, have to let you know we're running out of time. Um, we might have to wrap it up shortly. I think our technical difficulties might have put us a little behind schedule. So, okay, I will run through some of these very quickly for people and uh, uh, and then finish up fast. So, uh, be bold. So it doesn't necessarily mean shouting from the rooftops. It could be one-on-one -on -one conversations. It could be anything that rejects the status quo. Discomfort makes people stop and think, and the more of it, the better. So being bold. Now, when we're having those conversations with people, how do we think about calling people in? Loretta Ross was at Brock in March and talks about calling in. And I think what I'll hope is that the presentation can be shared so that people can actually look at this and spend some time uh, reading through uh, the way different ways to call in, how to be a calling in champion. And this is opposed to calling out. And so calling people out may need to happen. There's certainly situations where people need to be called out but it can also create a toxic environment. And that makes it really hard to be able to move forward. 
So how do we think about calling in, calling out as we're being bold? Speaking if others can't. Malala is saying, I do it because half of us are held back. But make sure that people really can't speak and don't assume that they need your voice when they might be doing their own work perfectly well by themselves. And there's a hyperlink so that you can read about young activists around the world who are doing their own work. They don't need us to be coming in and either telling them what to do or leading the way for them. They're already doing this work. We need to think about in that regard, what happens you know, as a reminder about the white savior industrial complex to think about the ways that that can interfere with our very well-intentioned activism. People around the world know what they want to be doing. They have answers. Sometimes they lack the resources, but they know what they want to be doing. One of the sort of ideas that as I think about that is the ways that certain issues, menstrual equity is an example, local to global. Here in Niagara, Period Promise is doing this incredibly important work of making sure that there's menstrual products available for everybody, particularly during this difficult time, but at any point in time. But there's people around the world who are also doing this. So there's a need for this everywhere, but people are doing it in their own way. So as I see Demi there, I will, uh, I'll move to my conclusion. Um, you can look through all of these different lessons there. I will pause to say that activism fatigue is a very real thing. Many of you are already tired. And I'll point you to Audre Lorde's comment, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. If you want to be taking action, you need to make sure you're in the very best place to be able to do that. So as I conclude, I'll leave you with some lines from Mary Oliver's poem, When Death Comes, who echoes Ostrowski that I was given when I was seven. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. So I leave you as a, with a reminder, you're not a tourist to our planet. Engage, make mistakes and change the world for better. Uh, my email is available for you if you're interested in continuing this dialogue or would like a copy of this PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leela. That was a great presentation and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sad that we had to cut it short and I apologize for that. Um, if anyone has any questions for Leela related to the presentation, you can send Leela a message directly on the EventMobi platform. Um, and she also put her email address in the last page there too. So hopefully we will be able to let you connect later. And I apologize again for the technical difficulties at the beginning. So everyone enjoy the rest of the summit. Take care. Thank you so much.